Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. So far in this unit, we've examined how, why, and where industrialization began, as well as how industry spread and grew around the world. Now, as we ought to remember, capitalism played a key role in facilitating industrial growth. So today, we'll take more of a look at industry and its relationship to the capitalist economy. Let's go to those essential questions. We're really going to focus in just on two things today. Managing industry in a capitalist economy, and then some of the challenges that are faced in a growing industrial economy. When it comes from a management standpoint, uh, we're going to look at things like a sole proprietorship. Uh, how is that different from a partnership? And how do they all compare to a corporation? Really, what is a corporation? And how do those things work? How are they managed in a capitalist system? Then as we move on to the challenges of the growing industrial economy, we're going to focus in on these things called business cycles or economic cycles. We'll look at the different phases in the economic cycles, see how those pose different challenges to people in a capitalist system. What are the characteristics of each of those phases? Uh, and what does it mean for everyone in that economy? Economy. So those are the essential questions. That's where we're headed today. So that's without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right, remember, entrepreneurs are the individuals who take the risk to start up and manage businesses, okay? Uh, and in a, in a capitalist system, managing businesses can be done in a variety of ways. Uh, you have the sole proprietorship. This is really the simplest way to do things. It's one single entrepreneur who raises the capital and manages the business single-handedly. Uh, the sole proprietor puts in all the money, invests the money in the, in the labor and the natural resources and the facilities. They control the production themselves. They run the business themselves. They take on all the risk associated with that business. Of course, if things are successful, they also get to reap the rewards of that business. But maybe going it alone is not your style. If that's the case, there's always a partnership. Partnerships involve two or more entrepreneurs who raise capital and manage their business together. The partners share in the risk and the profits of the venture. And it doesn't have to be just two people. It could be two. It could be three. It could be five. It could be ten. It could be twenty. Um, and as businesses get bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, partnerships become more and more common. So it's just two or more entrepreneurs who raise the capital and manage that business together. But as businesses get even bigger, spread out even more, become even more diversified, then the corporation can be the best and most profitable management method. Now, if you remember, the corporation is kind of like the modern ancestor of those old joint stock companies that we had discussed in the past uh, that were used to fund voyages and set up colonies where investors would buy stock and become part owner of the voyage, become part owner of the colony. Well, the corporation is their modern ancestor. A corporation is a business that is owned by stockholders who have bought shares or stock in the company. That's the way the corporation works as the modern ancestor to uh, the joint stock company. And when you buy stock or shares in a company, you become that part owner. Even if it's just one or two shares, you are a little part owner of that company. And individual stockholders, as little part owners, typically get to vote on major decisions concerning the corporation. A lot of corporations on a yearly basis have stockholders meetings. Okay, now, just because you own one or two shares of stock doesn't mean that you're going to come in and move mountains in the corporation because votes are weighted according to the number of shares that you own. The more shares that you own, the more influential you are in the corporation. A lot of times what happens is that when companies become corporations or do what they call going public, that's where you sell shares or stock in yourself to the public, typically the original owner will buy up more than half of the stock themselves so that they still have a controlling interest in the company. The more shares you own, the more influence you have. And if you own 51% of that stock, then you have 51% or majority control of that company. So the more shares you have, the more your vote is worth. Those who own the most stock have the most influence in the corporation. Now, speaking of those stocks or shares, the shares themselves increase or decrease in value depending on the profits earned by the corporation. When a corporation does well, sells a lot of its products, the value of the shares increase because a company becomes profitable. If Ford Motor Company is selling lots of cars and trucks, or Samsung sells lots of phones, or Apple sells lots of phones, they're making more money. More people buy into that stock, the value of the stock goes up. That means profits for the stockholder. Of course, the opposite is also true. If the corporation doesn't sell a lot of its products, uh, the corporation loses money, it loses value, and so people sell their their stocks and the value of the share decreases, which of course means a loss for those stockholders. 
Now, as the economy grows and expands, uh, we see the corporation become much more the norm, and a lot of the businesses, corporations, and industries all become interconnected and, and dependent upon one another. In a situation like this, when one industry does well uh, and sales are high, the other industries that are connected to it also flourish. Of course, again, the opposite is true. If sales are low for a particular industry, the bad conditions can spread to other related industries. This is kind of a gross example, but just kind of hear me out on this. Imagine you walk into a room and there are just spiders all over the ceiling. Sorry to the arachnophobes out there, but just imagine there's spiders all over the ceiling and they've all spun webs. There's so many spiders that the webs have become interconnected to one another. So long as they continue to work and spin and remain strong, the interconnected gigantic spider web will remain strong. Okay, that's like the interconnected businesses in the economy. But then imagine someone comes in and knocks down some of those webs. Well, all of these webs are interconnected, so what's going to happen to the others? They'll be drugged down as well, all right? Maybe a less gross example. Take, for instance, the relationship between construction industry and businesses that supply them with building materials. A little bit better than spiders, though I thought the spider analogy was actually pretty good. Anyway, so the construction company is building lots of buildings, whether it's office towers, strip malls, or homes. When they're building lots of buildings, they buy a lot of materials to do their work. They have to buy lots of concrete. They have to buy lots of steel from the steel companies. They have to buy windows from the glass company. Heck, there's even furniture that has to be bought for the offices and for the houses or for the strip malls. And so all of these companies who make stuff that the construction company needs, who make the concrete, who make the steel, who make the windows, who make the furniture, they're all selling lots of products when the construction company is building lots of buildings. The interconnection in these industries is all helping each other. As long as the construction company is building lots of buildings, then these other connected industries are doing well. They're selling lots of products. They're making more money. They're having to expand. They hire more workers. Those workers now have more money in their pocket, and they go spend their money at the grocery store, at the movie theater. They go buy a refrigerator or a new car, and this helps the economy to grow. The interconnectivity of these businesses in a capitalist system helps the economy to grow. Of course, the opposite is true if business slows down for the construction company. If they're building less buildings, that means they're buying less concrete, they're buying less steel, they're buying less glass, and people are then buying less furniture to go into the places that they are building. And as a result, those companies slow down. They have to slow production. They have to lay off workers. Those workers don't have money in their pockets, so those workers don't spend money at the store or the movie theater. They don't go buy the car or the refrigerator. Then those businesses are affected as well. And so with the interconnectivity of these businesses, uh, it becomes that the economic fate of an entire country can come to rest on these things that we call business cycles. Okay, In a capitalist economy, the business cycle is a normal part of the economic life cycle. Business cycles are just these normal uh, alternating periods of economic growth and decline. Economic growth and decline. It's like a roller coaster at the amusement park. Up and down, up and down. It's perfectly normal in a capitalist system. And all business cycles or economic cycles begin uh, with expansion where sales are high, production goes up, so you hire more workers because you're producing more stuff. Those people have more money in their pockets and they go spend it other places and the economy grows and flourishes. This is the growth phase or the boom phase, expansion. This is the good times in the capitalist economy. When everyone is making money, unemployment rates are very, very low, and everybody's pretty happy. That's the growth phase or the boom phase. It's economic expansion. But eventually it tops out. It reaches its peak. Eventually in the business cycle, activity slows down. People aren't buying as many products, and so sales drop off. Production slows down because companies aren't producing as much. They don't need as many workers, so they lay off or they fire workers. Those people don't have money in their pockets. They don't spend it at other businesses. So those businesses lose money as well, and people are getting laid off all over the place. The unemployment rate increases. This is the decline phase or the bust phase. And if things get low enough, uh, then you might even call it a recession. If this decline lasts for a certain number of economic quarters, then you even term it a recession. But 
recessions don't last. They don't stay at the bottom. It's typical of the economic cycle. Eventually, things turn around, and sales increase once again, and production increases, and employment increases, and you get what's called the recovery phase of the economic cycle. And so we continue in the peaks and valleys of the economic cycle. It is perfectly normal in the life cycle of a capitalist economy. And if things are left to, uh, to progress as they ought to, what you tend to see is that with each recession and recovery, and each recession and recovery, you have a stronger economy than the one before. And each recession isn't quite as bad as the one before, and the peak, the recovery, is even better and stronger than it was before. And that's the typical uh, level of life cycle of a capitalist economy. Now, if things get extremely bad, the lowest point in a business cycle is what we call a depression. A depression is characterized by widespread bank and business failures, widespread unemployment, and not just that, but it lasts for an extended period of time. Typically, I believe the depression tends to be defined by something like two years of economic downturn. The last time we had a really bad depression in the United States, of course, was the Great Depression that lasted from 1929 all the way up until about 1940. That's a very, very long time. That's why we called it the Great Depression. But you know what? The Great Depression did didn't last forever, as is typical of economic cycles. Eventually, the economy picked up again, and by the 1950s, uh, we were rolling in a way that we had never rolled before economically. It's just the life cycle of the capitalist economy. Those are the business cycles, and that's how it impacts life in the capitalist economy. But that looks like a good stopping point for today. I think we looked at two things, managing industry in the capitalist economy. We kind of saw the differences between a sole proprietorship, a partnership, and a corporation. We especially looked at the way corporations were managed. Then we saw some of the challenges of growing the industrial economy. We examined business cycles, the different phases in the business cycle, the growth phase, the decline phase, and of course, if things get really bad, the depression. So those are the essential questions, guys. It's what we covered today, and it's what you need to be ready to talk about the next time that we meet. And as always, until that time, I bid you farewell.